Hello, I think we, uh, we're, uh, we can start. Um, I'm glad to be here. It's my first time in London, on this side of the river. Um, my name is Irina. Uh, I'm from Romania, uh, in the second largest city called Yash. Um, I'm a software architect at Endava. Maybe you heard of this company. It's based in London. Um, and I organize a meetup where I try to bring people together to um, learn things and try to encourage them to teach things to other people. And also I teach .NET on Saturdays for five hours. But about me, that's enough. What we're gonna talk about today is uh, very easy and simple, just because um, we treat it lightly. We all uh, talk about REST, we brag about ourselves that we implement REST APIs, um, when actually we kind of don't. So that's why I chose the topic, to, to talk a little bit about REST and about GraphQL, because it's a bit of a hype right now, at least in the front-end world. So we're gonna talk about REST constraints. Uh, well, I do not agree with REST constraints because if they were a constraint, everybody would respect them. Uh, there are more like a guideline that us developers need to, to respect to have a fully capable and um, livable API. So these constraints or guidelines um, are just a few, but the most easy one is client-server. Um, I heard about this architecture in school as being uh, the most simple architecture. And actually it was the first time I heard about architecture in other domain than like construction. So client server, what does this mean? Well, it means that we have two parties involved, a client and a server that both needs to be pretty much up at the same time and they need to understand each other. The client asks something for the server and the server needs to understand what it's asked for and to respond back. Another constraint or guideline is that it should be stateless. As an architectural uh, style, represent a representational state transfer. This is REST, invented by uh, Roy Fielding in about 2000, I think, in his dissertation thesis. Uh, we take this REST as a concept very lightly and we treat it superficially. So stateless, what it means that is stateless or it should be stateless. Basically, uh, the server should have absolutely no trace about the previous requests that have been made. So um, stateless, if you heard this word, it's about HTTP mostly, right? HTTP as a protocol doesn't retain any state. And REST comes over this HTTP and says, you know what, if you issue a request, everything that you want in that request should be self-contained so that the server sh should understand that request in isolation. So you should have absolutely no trace of all of what it has been before, right? Even if there is an, uh, I don't know, a login detail, a token of any kind, that token should be contained in the request itself not stored in a cookie, uh, not, I don't know, hidden in somewhere, hidden fields like we used to do in ASP older versions. We had web forms. Have you worked with web forms? Yeah, nice. We had a lot of hidden fields there just to maintain state. Caching. Uh, this guideline says that we should use caching as a specification very uh, intensively. Like cache stuff in the browser, uh, in the client's browser, use it from there and so on. Uniform in, in interface. It's pretty much a bigger uh, constraint that says that everything is a resource. And no matter what it is in our application, it should be treated as a resource and that's it. Moreover, what we expose to the public through our APIs, it's a representation of what we have. We do not expose domain models directly to whatever client we have. We expose a representation of those resources we work with. And also, this uniform interface says that we should have self-descriptive messages. That is strictly tied into that uh, previous constraint, stateless. 
If you issue a request, everything should be there. Every header that you ever need, uh, every, I don't know, body that you need, the URL that you need should be in that request itself. And it should be like self-explanatory when you look at the request. Hate OIS, whoever heard of it, whoever implemented. My point exactly. <laughs> So it basically says that it's hypermedia as the engine of application state. The server should be the one that drives everything, and in each request should have a part that tells the client, you know what, from here you can navigate through there or backwards or to the other links. But we often refuse to do that because we think that it's a performance penalty, and we simply do not use that. And it's a major part in REST APIs. So I never did it in my APIs, so you didn't. So we completely ignored this part. So if you talk about REST, a REST API should be about verbs, right? Uh, verbs, the four ones, main ones that we're using, get, post, put, delete, and it's real meaning. We have more verbs, we don't, do not use those, but we often use even post verbs to update resources. You did that, I did it, I admit. At a certain moment in my developer's life when I was a junior, I did that. Because, I don't know, it was like a folklore and everyone did that, and so I did. So, uh, for example, headers. You use headers extensively to specify what you need from an API? Ah, depends on the context. You ever implemented custom headers to read from in a request and then on the server side to distinguish what you need to return back? You did that? So and so. How about status codes? We know the mainstream ones, 404, we use it in jokes and so on, but how many of you use state, correct status codes? Good for you. <laughs> for example, um, after a, a post request, right? A post request should have as a result creation of a new resource somewhere. And it's not an, uh, a dempotent, a dempotent uh, issue, right? So if you um, issue the same request over and over again, if you have a business logic that is strong, you shouldn't be allowed to, I don't know, create duplicate resources, right? So what status code do you return as a result of a post request? 200? And one. 201 is a success status code that says, you know what, this was created, right? So we tend not to use that. I don't know why, but I admit, I used to do that. But also, um, if you, I don't know, issue a request to create something, the request, the request is good, but you have a, something in your business logic that says, you know what, this is a duplicate thing. You cannot create this thing you're trying to because you already have one. Let's think about a case like, I don't know, registering with an email, right? The email address theoretically should be uh, unique. So if you try to register more than once with the same email, you should get back a status code. What is that status code? 400? But my request is okay. Not modified or how about uh, 409? Which means conflict. I mean, this is the way we are adding meaning to our requests, hence the responses. And the responses using one of the 41 uh, uh, status codes that are available for, for us. This way, when we see, I don't know, if a tester gives back a bug, you can look at the request and you can see at first hand what's happening. I mean, you can tell that tester, you know what? Uh, 409 means something. You did the request, okay, but our business logic says that you cannot effectuate this operation. How about, how about media types? We don't play around with accept property headers or content type to get a different representation of the resources. 
I don't know why we don't do that. Maybe because it's hard sometimes in a .NET to implement that. But what if we would have like intuitive endpoints? If we're talking about REST, we're also talking about naming, right? There are tons of blog posts and guidelines that says, okay, your endpoint sh should have a plural name to indicate that the endpoint deals with multiple resources, right? And we add meaning to each and every single verb, status code, hypermedia that we are using, and header. And we often forget that. So forgetting that, we're basically forgetting about HTT power. We are not adding, I don't know, headers to specify that a certain resource is cacheable and for how long and in which cases. We're not using e tags to help on that. We also, and more often than not, we rely on other technologies to do that instead of us. And because uh, REST APIs respond to different needs, we could also have, through headers, something that is called content negotiation. And it's very nicely implemented in ASP.NET Core. If you know how to turn off and turn on certain features. Uh, for example, through a specific header, uh, due to content negotiation that happens on the server side, uh, you might get a 200 as a response code and a JSON body back as a response. And with a different header, you might get back a 200 with an XML representation of that resource. And also, adding a different header, maybe you get no content in a body and a 415 as a status code. And that should indicate you what is happening in there. A 450 indi indicates that, well, your server doesn't know how to answer to you with the, that format you are asking. So each party needs to communicate through these mechanisms. Okay, what are the REST API benefits? For example, for, uh, I want to, to tell you a short story. Uh, when I switched companies, I, I landed on a specific project that was very big, and the developers were bragging that, oh, we have state-of-the-art microservices and REST APIs. And when I looked at their specifications, swaggers and so on, I saw that they had in, in endpoints uh, slash new, whatever resource slash create. That is not a REST guideline. <laughs> and uh, so further along that, they didn't have microservices in the real mini. But let's stick to the basics. So REST API should be scalable, right? Uh, because it, it is discoverable and it's intuitive. We, you, I don't know, you have an API that, I don't know, sells cat's food, right? It should be very easy for you to look at the endpoint and to figure it out what are the next requests you can do on that, uh, those resources. For example, how many of you, after a post request, include in the headers the location of the new resource that was created? Good one. <laughs> Find me later to talk about it. Uh, also, a REST API that, that by the book should be evolvable because it's all about in REST, evolvability. Um, moreover, the server should uh, drive the application state because you'll see uh, further along that also drives the application state, but also the client and the server can evolve independently in something like this. We have the horse, but maybe the horse evolves in a unicorn or your carriage becomes something with a motor. Uh, it doesn't mean that these entities cannot live together. It can live together, but using the, the specifics of REST. V1, it's familiar? It is. Uh, how many of you had V1 until the end of the life of that application from the beginning <laughs> of that application? I did. Um, so versioning. Again, we forget about headers, we forget about everything in there, and we stick with V1 
from the beginning till the end, and after we switch jobs, and after the, but I don't know, the business dies, we have Vion. But the entities in that Vion uh, change dramatically over time. So, uh, <clears throat> REST APIs are, are rare, are treated superficially, and this is one of the reasons I, I chose the topic, because you need discipline, and pressured by the delivery time, we often um, do not have time to, to have discipline, and needs constant design. So some might say that, okay, we have issues when dealing with REST APIs, uh, but those issues can be solved through constant design, but we do not have time to do that. So, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a quote here. It says that um, a reason to make a real REST API is to get evolvability. A V1 is a middle finger to your API customers, indicating that in fact it's not a REST, it's a HTTP RPC style. Uh, who said that? The inventor of REST in 2003 on a tweet. And it's very nice because it's so real. So uh, if you have V1, pretty much, you'll stick with V1. So versioning in REST API should be done to headers, mostly, because they said that cool URIs don't change. Stay the same. So if you add a V1 and then a V2, you, you kind of change the, URL, uh, the URIs. Also, a big issue with REST is that uh, those APIs are chatty. Tend to bring everything uh, over to the client side, uh, forces you to get something else, issue additional requests, and have something like this, right? Every time when you have an API exposed to a client in your team, or not your team, you have exact fetching, right? The client gets exactly what they need, right? No, it's not. Think about it. You own the API, and maybe you have some colleagues that are working on the client side and then you can talk with them, they will tell you what they need, you will tell them what you sent from the API, uh, you discuss, you remove properties that are uh, returned in JSONs, uh, and pretty much this is it. It's a constant chit chat, right, between the, the teams to decide what is needed. But it's, REST doesn't do exact fetching, we force exact fetching by discussing with other teams. What would happen if, for example, you would have an API exposed to the public and you do not own the client? You would have absolutely no way to know what is used from your APIs or what not. So basically, REST, it's about overfetching and underfetching. What means overfetching? Means that you kind of get more data that you need for your client. Um, and some people in the industry said, yeah, okay, bullshit. That is uh, done and solved by constant design. But we do not do that, so we'll stick, we stick to this problem. If you're lucky enough to have time, we're not. Underfetching forces you to make other calls to get additional data to fill out the page. Think about it. Um, if you have an online store, right? You have a list of products and then you click on a product and you'll have, I don't know, description, images and so on. And then you'll have a tab with reviews and then a tab with, I don't know, uh, price fluctuation and so on. Every single of those, it's an additional request to get data to populate a single page. So it forces you to bring, to make more calls and transport data over the network more than you need. So a REST client will force you to do this. Call an endpoint for a restaurant, for example, to get a list of restaurants. Then you pick one, and then you'll get an endpoint for that restaurant ID. And then you're interested in reviews, like we all use TripAdvisor when you go some places to see what's around and how good it is. So it will force us to do all these requests. And if there are only these requests, we're lucky, but additional things in more complicated applications <laughs> will require more, more calls, more data transfer, and more money from our business because uh, all this data is made, uh, is transferred to the network. So 
REST APIs almost fully use HTTP. Uh, we have no hypermedia to drive the application state because we think that is a uh, performance penal penalty and we do not want that. Uh, we kind of forget about the usage of headers. Um, it's resource based, but naming is complicated. Even in variables, more than endpoints, depending on how uh, uh, complicated the business is. So we kind of bad name stuff. In REST, we kind of have no way of, I don't know, modeling actions. Have you ever encountered a situation like this? You have like, I don't know, uh, an action to model. Do that. Well, it's kind of not a resource, so it doesn't meet the requirements, the plural, the ID, and the relational stuff. It's an action, like compute something. Do the math. It's not in the guidelines. How do you pass the parameters to add those? It's complicated. So we stick to bad namings. Accept versus content types. Very important uh, properties in headers that we often forget that will give us back resources that are different or different representation, in fact, of uh, the same resource. Self-descriptive messages, status codes as they should be. Most of us did all these things, or didn't do. So uh, why not choose the different technologies that will completely uh, remove everything that we need to know about REST and simplify our lives? So then, we're gonna see about GraphQL. What it is. So it is a query language uh, invented uh, by Facebook because we all stay on Facebook, scroll around, get a ton of information at once, very fast. Um, they kept it internally uh, or until around 2015 and then exposed it uh, to the public. And nowadays, it's a very popular technology uh, in the front-end world. They have Apollo client that does a lot of things and so on. But today, we're gonna see how it is to implement such an API for a client, whatever the client is, uh, in .NET. So, a query language that promises to solve the issue with overfetching and over underfetching that REST has. Facebook used it, GitHub has a v4 API that is fully on, um, on GraphQL, Yelp, KLM, PayPal. Pretty much big players in the industry use GraphQL or exposed uh, endpoints based on GraphQL. So we'll get only this using GraphQL. Okay, so if we switch back and revise uh, the schema with the requests, now we have a client that issues a request and gets back uh, data from three other places, but doing just one request. Pretty nice, right? I mean, three calls to an API that aren't made, and we get the data that we need without calling, I don't know, the reviews, the ID, and so on. All at once, pretty neat. So, something like this, APIs, speakers, um, collection endpoint, uh, by ID, something related to, um, won't be there. You won't need it, forget about it. So, now, in GraphQL, we do not have all the meaning that we should have had in, uh, in REST. We have only post as a verb. We do not do gets or puts or deletes. We do only posts. We can add headers. Um, and we do not care about status codes at all. So think about this. We have an endpoint that returns speakers. We are at a conference and we know about speakers. So um, maybe we have this kind of information that comes back, but we need only the pink ones. You know, REST APIs would be pretty hard to implement. Uh, how about the endpoint by ID? That is a convention. Also, we need only the pink ones. Uh, so what do we do in REST? We go to the database and remove them completely? No. We need them, maybe from on the administration side, uh, side of the website. We need them, we need to store it. 
So how do we do this in REST? Well, in REST, you either create a different endpoints uh, or use the headers, the correct headers, to get you only the, the pink ones, or pretty much this is it. But it's pretty, it's tedious to do that, right? To create a different representation of the same resource when you need only uh, those uh, pink fields. How about related stuff? You need for the speakers all the, uh, the talks. Maybe you're interested in a history for a certain conference. Uh, how about if you would get something like this at once? So you get the description, the title, the speaker, and the first name at once. You would do a join in the database, right? But the endpoint in REST would be the same. Okay, let's forget about REST for now and move on. What is GraphQL and what are the building blocks? Basically, because it's a query language, uh, we have a schema where we need to define, a framework where we need to define uh, the things that we are working on and exposing. We will have queries uh, that will represent basically the get, get request we're used to in REST. We will have mutation, that is that post request that I told you that is made to do like add stuff, update or delete data. So basically we have three verbs in one and it's called a mutation. And then we have subscription, like where you can subscribe to event and expose those. Uh, it's based on fields, resolvers and types that are predefined in GraphQL uh, and you can extend those to make your own. So what is a query in, in GraphQL? Basically, a query is everything that can be questioned from the outside. It can have headers. You, maybe you need to have additional logic in there that you put in headers. You're allowed to do that. Uh, and you can run several in parallel. For example, you can uh, run a query at in the same time to get your uh, feedbacks and to get talks. Okay, what do you need to do? Is to use a tool write something like this that is very similar to JSON. It's not JSON, but it's ish, JSON-ish. So you start with the query type, and then you'll have like, I'm interested in a query that I expose to called speakers, and from those speakers, I need only those properties. What you'll get back, you'll get something like this. That is pretty much real JSON, that has only the properties you need. The same uh, you can do for um, a query by an ID. Nothing stop you, th stops you to include an ID there. So for example, I'm interested in the talk, talk with ID two, and I'm interested in the description, the title, and the speakers, and from the speakers, only the last name. And I will get back data like this all at once. Okay, let's see a bit of, uh, how it works. I'm gonna run this and then we're gonna dig into uh, .NET details. You can also um, use Postman to make queries. And I'm gonna show you this. I hope it's visible enough. Okay, for example, I told you that we start with query as a keyword, and from there, we're gonna have all the options that we expose, like IntelliSense and Visual Studio. So from here, I'm gonna uh, be interested in speakers, and from these speakers, I'm interested in the company name, and also in the first name. This is exactly what I want to, I want to, to get back. I'm gonna click Prettify to make that, them aligned. I'm gonna run it. And I'm gonna get pretty much all the speakers that I have in my database, a big database. But pretty much this is it. It's simple as that. What, it's happen what it happens behind the scenes is that a, a post request is issued to my endpoint and I get back the data in JSON format because it's the only format that uh, it knows how to, to use right now. Okay, a mutation. Well, a mutation 
It's either a post, either an update, either a delete. Uh, it also can have headers, but you only uh, you can only run it one by one. So you cannot like create uh, three entities at once, just one by one. So a mutation looks like this. It won't have the query a keyword anymore. It will have a mutation keyword, and then you'll need to define uh, variables, uh, like in JavaScript. For example, this mutation is called create talk. Uh, and it has a parameter called talk. And we um, define it with a dollar because it's a, it's a JavaScript-ish parameter. So I create the talk, and when I get the answer back, I need the title, description, and the speaker ID for the talk. So I create with this parameter, and I get back only the three fields that I specified. Okay, this is a mutation, seems simple. And to me, um, it seems very GRPC, old stylish calls, or soap. Have you ever used soap that had whistle stuff where all the action were, were available? It pretty much, it's similar. Because now you do not have the intuitive endpoints to, um, to allow you to issue different kinds of requests. Another thing that is available in um, GraphQL is a subscription where you can use SignalR and different other technologies, but in.NET is done uh, through WebSockets. So if you want to expose a subscription in the client, you need to use SignalR, but between services it's uh, done through WebSockets, where basically you subscribe to events, right? You are interested to be notified whenever uh, something is created or updated or a specific mutation it's called. Okay, so this is about all the theoretical stuff around uh, GraphQL. Uh, and we're gonna see how it is to do with this in .NET, because that's why you're here. Okay, right. click new project, API, and so on, right? What you need to do to install everything that you need for GraphQL. You need to install a package called GraphQL. Then another package, called transport ASP.NET Core. Then you need to install a playground. A playground is basically that graphical interface that allows you to do queries easily. They're more intuitive, has that IntelliSense-ish uh, stuff. And then you need to add middlewares sometimes. And then you need to create the schema. The schema was that building block that comprised queries, mutations, and subscriptions. And then, Come on. You'll need to resolve every query that you want to expose through dependency injection, and then resolve mutations, and if you have resolved subscriptions. So you're done. No, you're not. Because uh, basically, we're gonna see that you will need to define your graph entities, every available query in your application to expose uh, to the public, every mutation that it ever needed in, in the application, uh, schema and mutation to build that, field by field. How does this sound? Right? But uh, unfortun fortunately, um, they did something like this. So you have the, a conference schema, because this is the, the topic of the application uh, I'm having as a demo. So you need to have a conference schema that is inherited from GraphQL schema, and then you inject that dependency resolver, and you specify, you know what, I have a query as a general uh, building block of my GraphQL API, I have a query, resolve this through the conference query. And then if you have mutations, you have to do the same. So this schema will only have like three blocks, queries, mutations, and then, uh, subscriptions if you have. After you define this, then you need to deal with the entities that you expose to this API. For example, I, I'm exposing a speaker. A speaker as in a different time that, uh, type that in my domain model. And here, one by one, I need to specify the fields that I'm exposing through. After I uh, inherited of object graph type of my 
real domain object. Okay, uh, you need to do this, and after this, you're pretty much done with the entity that you're exposing. Uh, after you define the, the speaker entity, then you need to go in your query, the main building block that is a query, to, uh, to say, you know what, I have a query that is called speakers. So if you have speakers in your playground, you might see the list of fields that you previously defined in the, uh, in the type. So how is that resolved? Well, easy. You have a description just to help you out. And you'll have resolve. And what you do in that resolve is to call your repository to get everything that you need in there. So this is all the resolving stuff. Um, a mutation, um, it's pretty much similar. You need to define field by field the input type. So pretty much what you require for a post, for example. What are the fields that you require for a post? Um, you give that mutation a name, uh, and then you need to resolve it. Basically, you need to specify there what happens when somebody uses your muta mutation. Calling a repository to save that data, okay? Pretty much this is it in big lines. So um, let's see it in code. Uh, I hope it's visible enough. Okay, so starting from scratch, um, I will show you the, the general structure. Pretty much I have the data, a data, classical, you saw it everywhere as a project structure. Uh, I have entities, domain entities. I have speaker with a few properties. I have a talk with a few properties. And from there, I have repositories with CRUD uh, operations. So I have get all, I have get by ID, uh, and I have the add one. Yeah, pretty much to cover every scenario for a specific entity. And from there, I also have, uh, where is it, talks in a similar manner. So I have get all, get all for a certain speaker, get all by ID, and add. So pretty much everything, uh, it's common, right? Okay, so this is the data part. And then I will have another that we're going to talk about later, a service where you can aggregate data. Don't do that, but it, as a demo, it works. So GraphQL API. So let's see a little bit. In startup, uh, you need to wire things up. And by wiring, using dependency injection for your type, you already uh, do this. And also, you need to have uh, the conference schema. So the schema will be the one that will pretty much hold everything every one of the three building blocks in GraphQL, a query mutation and a subscription if you have one. And you need to say that, okay, I have a query uh, that is found in here, and you need to resolve that. In the same manner, you'll have like a mutation, and every mutation that I, is available in my app is found here, so resolve that. Okay, uh, then you will need to ha have the add GraphQL. Right? Plug and play. And then uh, you say to the platform, use GraphQL with the conference schema that contain, contains every query and mutation and subscription in my API. And then you have the um, option of configuring different um, UI tools. Uh, six months back, there was only one that com com came as the default, which was this which is not, I do not prefer this uh, when showing it to people because the contrast is not good. But I can also have something like graphical, oh, not this, that it's cleaner, I think, and white and easier to, to follow. So pretty much in here I will run everything uh, that I expose to the application, I'm gonna click to execute and I get the results in the right side. It's very uh, intuitive and very nice for a developer as a, an experience. So I get this IntelliSense-ish uh, stuff that I also um, allows me to, to select whatever I need there. So you'll see 
uh, it's added in the other side as a response. Okay, so uh, GraphQL Playground is the default one and Graphical um, is the other one. How do you obtain that? What, depending on the color you pre prefer, is like GraphQL server, UI, and then you have several options to, to choose from. There are like, I don't know, four or five that are available for you to use. Uh, meanwhile, the open source uh, contributors guys worked and uh, included those in, uh, in .NET. Hey, yay to them. Okay, so let's get back to the, our queries. So our queries, um, a query, that building block, the main, the get ones from the rest, are defined in here. So I say, I have a query uh, available under this name, speakers, uh, that has a description and that will resolve by calling my speaker repository get all. Easy as that. But uh, this field comes from a GraphQL, list graph type. So it's a list of graph type of type speaker. You'll see a lot of templating in GraphQL. How a speaker defined looks like. So it's basically a different class. Uh, some, uh, some guys use like speaker input source or speaker query just to discern the entities. Because what you basically do is to inherit for, from your domain object speaker as you have it in the database with all the fields you need there. And then build on it to define it under the GraphQL uh, name. So field ID, blah, 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 and the description. So for example, if you remove a field from here, you won't see it anymore in the playground. So it won't be available to be queried in there. So uh, pretty neat. You need to do another class that inherits from your class and you'll have it all in here. So going back, speakers. So I'm interested in a company name, description, last name. Let's add another one, first name, and run it. And you'll see, you'll, you'll uh, see the stuff in here. Okay. This is with the speakers, the most simple one. Let's see what else do we have. So we have uh, in here something that um, will be available under the query name talks. So I will be able to get the talks by using this. Uh, a small description and then how it will be resolved by getting all talks async, right? We'll talk about uh, the behind the scenes uh, a little bit later. Okay, so I can get back to my uh, graphical and say, you know what? I'm not interested in speaker anymore. I'm interested in um, talks. And uh, from the talks, I need a description, and let's run it. See, uh, depending on this um, playground you're using, you will need to add the, here it requires me the keyword query, and graphical it doesn't. So you need to know what you're doing there. Okay. So talks, descriptions, blah, blah, blah. And I'm interested in what we're exposing. So I'm interested maybe in the title. Okay, and I'm gonna run it. So, okay, I also get the title for each talk I get here. And I'm also maybe interested in feedbacks. Feedbacks is another query that is made in another object. Let me show in a sec. If you run this without any property specified, you'll get an error. You. You not get an error. Feedbacks, run. It has a default ID. Graphical, pretty nice. Okay, let's try here. Talks, description. Okay, feedbacks. I think it's the first time when a speaker wants his demo to, <laughs> to break, and it doesn't want to break. Anyhow, voila, yay. 
So depending on the, the playground, you'll get something like this. A message, not a status code, um, just a message with a validation error. It says that feedback of type blah, blah, blah must have a sub-selection, which means that it forces me to go in here under feedbacks and uh, select what I need from that object. So, for example, I need the delivery and I also need some content. And then when I run it, I should get an array of feedbacks with those properties I'm specifying. Okay, getting back to the code, looking at the talks. So I have here talks, okay. On the same pattern that I used before um, in the speakers, I'm inheriting object graph uh, type from the talk that I have in the database. I specified field by field, and if I ever want to make a sub-query on this, I will just need to resolve that. So this is how I, I designed it. For each talk, I will allow to get feedbacks and I need to specify to the schema how it will obtain those feedbacks. So how easy you specify the name as, as you did before and then um, you tell it how to obtain the data behind it. Okay, so this is under the talks. Moving along, uh, speaker easy. So if I'm not exposing here a subquery, it won't be available for me to, to use. If I'm exposing in this uh, ob object type another subquery, it will be visible. And under my main query, if I will comment feedbacks, because now I'm allowed to use feedbacks, it won't show up in the in the playground. Ooh -hoo. Okay, so talks, let's see what else is available in here. Something that I didn't show you before. I gave them names like uh, to be more intuitive, but you can uh, use different uh, different namings. Speaker by ID. It's very soapish. I mean, uh, you can use this. It will prompt you the ID. You will need to specify uh, specify uh, a number in there, and then you need to specify the fields that you really want back. So run it, and you'll get this for the speaker with ID two, and then we're gonna need something else like description, uh, description was there, and uh, psh, Twitter, perfectly fine, it's not. But this is not resolved by me in, uh, in, the, in the field. Okay, uh, moving on. If we're talking about mutation, it's the same story. So you'll need to have a, big class that will wrap everything, uh, in my case called conference mutation, and you pretty much will expose uh, the available actions, like create talk, and you also need to tell it how to validate. It will get what you pass as an argument from the playground, and then you will resolve that by uh, saving it into database. Uh, the same happens, for example, if I want to create a new speaker. I'm going to uncomment this. And I also will rely on something to, to speed up things. Mutation, come on. It will open up. So a mutation is not very uh, different, but it has a keyword mutation. And it's playground. And then I will have it paste it in here. So it's a mutation, it has a variable of uh, speaker input type. I want back only these three fields whenever I, uh, the operation succeeds. And then here I have a variable uh, with the properties I need. And if I'm running this, uh, I'm, you're gonna see that I get back only the three fields that I specified in the mutation uh, back there. And it also, it is in the database. So uh, if you want to get back to the old times with SOAPish, uh, go ahead and use GraphQL. No, I'm joking. Um, GraphQL is awesome. Uh, just because even if you are doing some extra stuff, um, it doesn't mean that you don't need to do REST APIs. 
For example, the feedbacks that I uh, received, uh, it's, it were from a different API called from server to server. So you need to uh, make APIs that aggregate data to expose them to clients. So client performance is first. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Okay, so client performance first, think about it. Um, REST tends to get back to the, the, the client the fullest of what it has, right? Everything. So a cool part of GraphQL is that it does exact fetching. You specify what you need, you get only that and pretty much that's it. It does less round trips. I mean, it doesn't force you to make three calls to get to populate a page. It's a wonderful experience for humans once you have the API uh, ready and implemented. Um, and if we think about it, it has um, a cost impact because you're transferring data uh, less to the network. Uh, you're, in a way, reducing costs. I mean, everyone tries to move to cloud. Getting data from cloud to your clients with, I don't know, properties that they do not use means a cost. And reducing uh, the, the amount of data that you're transferring means re uh, reducing the cost. Also, think about how much data we're feeding through Facebook when you're scrolling into the app. Uh, such kind of experience wouldn't be possible without GraphQL. I mean, it, uh, if they would been stuck with REST, a lot of calls were, were made. And I think our life wouldn't be so nice and the experience of scrolling Facebook over novelties um, wouldn't be that nice. So when it's cool to switch over or try GraphQL, when you have a restish API, I mean, only <laughs> with the, the main parts, and when you want to defer the understanding of the domain, I mean, if you expose um, something to the, uh, the API, you let the, uh, the client the front-end guys decide what they need. You don't need to sync with them anymore. Uh, it's easy to get started, you install that, understand uh, the building blocks. It has that built-in introspection that is real cool, it's friendly, and it's contract-driven. I mean, the client tells you I need that and that, and you just ship it. Um, and now, in .NET, we have multiple UI stuff -ish to play around. It's pretty awesome for small project, and when you need, as a business, from the business perspective, a gateway-like API. I'm not telling you to, okay, do not do REST APIs, do them. But if the business requires it, you can also aggregate different APIs into one and expose, expose GraphQL endpoints. Um, when to use it? When you care about bandwidth and the costs associated with it. And also when you have no control over the client app or if you have mobile app, you expose APIs for mobile. Or if you ever want to empower your consumer. Is GraphQL better than REST? Let's see. This is uh, stolen from <laughs> dependency injection, but it works like a charm. Uh, with GraphQL, the server doesn't drive the application state. It's the other way around. So the client decides what are the next steps steps that uh, are made. So problems, you pretty much forget about HTTP, caching and blah, blah, blah. Um, not possible. I mean, how do you do caching? You do not have a client to tell them through a header to store the data in there. You need to do stuff in, in memory. Um, how about querying database? You'll have super performant queries, right? because you're using GraphQL. No, you're not. Uh, it doesn't save you from getting data from the database through your server side. If you need to, I don't know, improve performance, you need to do it and fine tuning your queries yourself. So it doesn't reach through the database. It, it's not skipping layers. It's, there are the same principles that applies there. So you get data on the server side, you put GraphQL on it, and you let the clients decide from your server side to, the, uh, to it, to the client, what data it wants. Not the other way around. You cannot say, okay, here's a GraphQL query, 
here's it to the database, database, give me only on these fields and client, here it is. You cannot do that. So you still bring data over to the server side from the database. Um, single endpoint and a single post request means that your queries are not that understandable. Caching, um, <clears throat> it's not anymore. Forget about that. Uh, but pretty much they're trying to improve this by using something that is called a data loader. And it doesn't apparently work. I didn't show you, it, it doesn't work, trust me. Um, what it does is basically creating some kind of a dictionary in code. So you bring data from the, the database, you're issuing a query to the database, and you keep it in memory associated to a key. And then next time when the client issues the same request, it will serve that from in memory in the server to the client. And this is how they are trying to solve this caching issue. Or you can do it yourself, add the Redis layer and so on. Um, but it's still work in progress in this world. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this data, data loader tries to solve the amplison problem pretty much. So bring that data over and over again. And also it, it can batch multiple requests into one. So you have uh, seven queries sent from the client side. Uh, you will need to modify your repositories to accept IDs to bring more data at once. So it's not a silver bullet in this, in this area. Um, as I already told you, you have to hold it in memory. So drawbacks. Uh, where you can use it in pretty much anything that can issue a HTTP request. You can add the GraphQL on top of it. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. Um, a few resources, but there are a few guys that are um, trying to improve this uh, GraphQL into .NET open source, and if you ever want to contribute, a lot of people will thank you for that. Um, and what I wanted to, uh, to remain after this is that all the, our distributed systems are about trade-offs, so never ever uh, throw yourself into using a, sp a specific technology without uh, comparing several technologies. Uh, even if, I don't know, it's shiny, it's a hype in the front end world, doesn't mean that we should be forced to use it. Of course, it has a lot of benefits, but uh, the drawbacks, worth it. I mean, uh, not having caching is really worth it, and a single endpoint, and not being able to, I don't know, uh, for performance, caching versus performance versus less data transferred from the server to the client. You need to balance that yourself. So um, thank you for being here today. If uh, there are any questions, I'll be around or DM me on, on Twitter. I will gladly respond to those. So thank you.